Welcome to the second lecture of the basic part. Here we will go through some botnet architectures and the first one is a, a really simple one which is a, a decentralized architecture. So you simply have a botmaster who has control of a command and control server and the command and control server has contact to a number of bots. Uh, of course this contact is uh, through the internet. Um, try to think about what do you think are the strengths and weaknesses of this kind of architecture. Okay, if I should give the answer, I would say that first of all, the command and control server is relatively easy to find because it is, a, a, because it is connected to the infected machines. Um, so if you gain access to the infected machines, you will relatively easily be able to find the command and control server. Um, secondly, uh, if you take down the command and control server, you kill the botnet. So it's not very uh, robust and it's not very good in order to hide the, um, the botmaster. Then you can do it more advanced by making it peer-to-peer -peer. and in this case you have a lot of uh, bots which you can say are all, all equal. The botmaster simply injects his command into one of them and then through, uh, through the routing mechanism in the botnet the information reaches all the bots eventually. Um, here it's more difficult to trace the command control server and therefore it's also more difficult to shut down but if the network becomes and it's also more reliable in the sense that if, uh, if one or two or more computers are removed uh, it doesn't really do any harm and it's very hard uh, if you find one computer that is infected you can see who it is communicating with but probably it is not the botmaster and then you need to find that machine and you need to find out who is that communicating with and it's very hard to roll back in order to find the command control server um, but it's also a more complex structure and it's a more um, it takes time to reach all zombies and you uh, you don't have so much control of it so it's it's hard to control then you have the changing servers where you don't have uh, one server all the time but with some intervals that could be days or hours you are changing the command and control server and moving it uh, which makes it uh, harder to shut down uh, the different servers and, and therefore the network. And what you can do is also that, that each bot at the same time can have uh, code to the addresses for more than one server. So even if one server is taken down, uh, the, the bots can still communicate to the, to the other servers that could be available. So if a server is shut down, it doesn't shut down the botnet. Um, fast logs is also important to understand. Uh, but, in, uh, but in order to understand, first you need uh, to know how DNS is working. So DNS um, provides a translation from domain names, such as www.google.com, to IP addresses such as 196.68.something.something. Um, so to show here in a very simple figure, I have my computer, I want to look up uh, www.google.com. So when I type www.google.com into my browser, what really happens underneath is that first I'm sending a request to my DNS server saying uh, what is the IP address of google.com and I get an IP address back. So then I send a request to this particular IP address and say please send me google.com and then I will receive it back. So all communication in the internet is based on these IP addresses. Um, so one way of using this when you run a botnet uh, is to do fast flux where you have very uh, fast changing IP addresses and or very fast changing domain names. So in the example here where I have an infected uh, client uh, or a client that is infected with botware, what he does first is that he sends a DNS request to some fast flux domain, could be some uh, domain name with a weird name or some, um, some name that, uh, that the botmaster is operating and he is sending this to a, to a malicious DNS server. So the server you see out to the left on the screen is controlled also by the botmaster. Um, and then you get a response back for that particular IP address. Uh, and you direct, and this is what you see in line number three, you direct the infected client to a, to a, a proxy bot, which is not really a bot in itself, but it's just acting as a proxy. So it's forwarding information from from other bots to the malicious server. 
So in this way, the, the address of the malicious server will be very hard to find. And of course, you can change these addresses very quickly, so you can change them within uh, minutes or even within seconds. So you look in one domain, and then you get some I addresses back, and if you look 10 minutes after, for the same, um, for the same domain, you could get a handful of different IP addresses. So it will be very, very hard to, to, um, to trace back. It should also be noted that in this case, suppose here when you're using fast logs and with, um, with the changing servers, with the peer-to-peer -peer and so on, often the command and control servers will be located in different countries and the bots will be located in different countries, which makes it also so harder to close down the, the botnets. Um, what is worth noticing here is that in fact, many of these architectures, I've just given some few examples, but often they're combined into hybrid architectures. So you can also have, if you take the centralized architecture, you can also combine that with having some proxy bots, which makes it harder to, to find, uh, even a centralized command and control server. You can have a centralized system where you have a couple of servers that have some round robin. So, so you might have five servers that are sharing the load, and even if one is closed down, the rest can still survive. Um, so you can combine these. You uh, often use hierarchies for scalability, so you have the bots down here, then you have a higher layer with some kind of proxy, and you have proxies above and so on, and then you have the bot master all uh, on top of it all uh, to improve the resilience. The resilience. Um, yes. Um, so hard the activities, what is often done is if botnets were using their own protocol, it would be pretty easy to detect uh, even at the command and control phase. So often they will be using standard protocols where one is uh, IRC, which is Internet Relay Chat uh, protocol. Um, it's, it seems to be pretty common protocol for bots, but it's also easy to detect in networks where IRC traffic is not expected. And that's why we are seeing a, a growth in the number of bots that use uh, HTTP, so a simple uh, hyper uh, text transfer protocol that is also used for, for, for web pages. It seems to be a bit harder to deploy, uh, so it's a bit harder to use it, but it's also harder to detect because HTTP traffic is so common and, and uh, it's hard to distinguish. Uh, you can say, okay, we can try to find it because some domain names, they look weird, but then you need some mechanisms in order to filter what are good looking and, and not so good looking domain names. So it's hard to detect, but uh, communication can also happen through instant messengers or through peer to peer protocols. And often you are using encryption or you are somehow randomizing the content of the packets to avoid that they are easily recognized in the network. So there are different ways of, uh, of trying to hide and trying to look like completely genuine traffic. So that was the end of the second part. So from here, please take the quiz and see you soon in part number three. Ciao.